invite you to listen in as we go into the word. Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pastor. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endure to all generations. We God have blessed with those years and doors of his word. Tonight is found in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We are, we are continuing in Acts chapter 8 on tonight. We thank God for another privilege, another honor. This is another great opportunity just to study His Word. Amen. Aren't you glad yeah. that you got a chance? You got another chance, another opportunity to study the Word of God. Hallelujah. We honor him tonight. We thank him for who he is and what he's already done. The God we serve is such an awesome and amazing God. Amen. Last week we looked at the first part of Acts chapter 8. Tonight we'll see how far we get when we look at chapter 8. What are some of the things that we pointed out on last week? 
Acts chapter 8 in the, in the New Testament. The book is Acts chapter 8. We pointed out the fact that Saul was present when Stephen was killed and Saul was in agreement with the death of Stephen. The Bible says that Saul was still breathing threatenings, meaning that he was at the point where he was willing to accept the fact that Stephen is now dead and he was going about arresting Christians and kill, killing Christians, amen? So we know that sometimes people can do some things that they think are right when they're really not of God. So Paul thought he was, I mean Saul, I'm sorry, Saul thought he was right when he was killing Christians. Do you know anybody who think they're right when they're wrong? Yes. Other than you. People think that they're right when they're wrong. They are very, 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 very influential in making sure that everybody knows that they're right. So Paul, the Bible says that Paul held the coats, held the coats of the men who killed Stephen. He held the coats of the men who killed Stephen. He held their coats. What does it mean when you say he held their coats? What does it mean? He held their coats. He didn't get his hands dirty. He held their coats. He he was just as guilty, but he wasn't the actual one who threw the stones, but he was just as guilty because he was consenting with them. So when we move to chapter 8, that's how the, the Acts writer starts by telling us that Saul was going about threatening and prosecuting and persecuting the church. Then it talks about the fact that Jesus was preached. If we're going to um, get anywhere with the kingdom, get anywhere with the Lord, we got to teach and preach Jesus. Amen? Amen? We can't preach and teach anything or anybody other than Jesus the Christ. No thing and nobody is more important than Jesus the Christ. If we're going to win a godly life, if we're going to live a godly life, we got to do it through Jesus. There is none like him. John chapter 3 verse 16 says to us that for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son, meaning his only one of a kind son, God gave Jesus. He's his only one of a kind son. He's his only unique son. His name is Jesus. So Peter preaches Jesus. I mean, Philip preaches Jesus. And as he preached Jesus, there's a guy there called Simon. Who is Simon? Who is Simon? Who is Simon? Simon. The Simon the sorcerer. He had bewitched the people. He had amazed the people. He had convinced the people that his magic was working. And they relied on Simon the sorcerer. The problem with Simon the Sorcerer is that he dwelt with power that was not of God. You do know the devil has power, right? He doesn't have all power, but the devil has power. And because the devil has power, then we need to understand that the devil can influence people with his power. He influences people to make people think that they really got it going on, they got it right, and they they really are doing great things. Fella told me when I first started pastoring, he said to me, now look, you don't want to get crossways with me, preacher, because people all over this city know me. In order to calm the storm, I wouldn't say what I was thinking. I was thinking, yeah, they do know you, but they know you to be an ungodly man. Then I should have gone on and told him, but I didn't. I told him that because you are known to be an ungodly man, there's nothing to brag about. So Simon the Sorcerer understood that he had power. He understood that he influenced the people, and the people gave in to Simon the Sorcerer. But one day, 
Simon the Sosa got saved. He heard the word of God. When we look at the text, we understand that when you hear the word of God, you hear Jesus preach, your life cannot be the same. Amen. When you see and you hear Jesus, your life cannot be the same. You must change. Amen. And you will change. Simon the Sosra got saved. The devil got saved. The man that was influencing people in the wrong direction messed around and got saved. But you do know when we're saved, we're still babies, right? And we still look at that old life. And when we look at the text, we find in verses 14 uh, to the end of this pericope, we understand even though Simon was saved, he was a babe in Christ. And when you are a babe in Christ, you do baby things. You do things that babies do. You pout like babies. You act like babies. You talk like babies. Your life is based on that life that babies depend on. So Simon the Saucer, even though he's saved, he still carries over that sinful life. He carries over that sinful life. So Simon the Saucer receives Peter, uh, Philip, and he's walking, and he's blessing the people, and all of a sudden Simon the Saucer says, I'm going to get me some of that. The people are being blessed and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Simon the Sorcerer, and you know, when you're a shyster, you don't become an unshyster overnight. Yes? If you shysty and you get saved, you're a saved shyster. <laughs> Simon the Sorcerer was a saved shyster. And he says, I tell you what, I want some of that Holy Spirit. The problem is, the Holy Spirit is a he and not a it. And because the Holy Spirit is an intelligent person, the tri a part of the triune God, the third person of the triune God, then he ought to be respected as such. He ought to be addressed as, a, as such. You don't want anybody to call you it, do you? You a body. You are somebody. And you are somebody special, right? Yes. So you want you want people to know because you are somebody, you want them to address you as a body, as a person. So when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we need to acknowledge him as the third person of the Trinity, the third person of the triune God. He is a person with intelligence. Therefore, the Holy Spirit doesn't hit you. I think I said it again. Boy, the Holy Spirit hit her, and she started doing all this stuff. The Holy Spirit doesn't hit you. When you receive Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in. He dwells with you. He lives in you. He influences you. And when you do what you do in the midst of the Holy Spirit influencing you, it's, it's understood that it's because your spirit matches the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit has control, we like to say you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, that means that the Holy Spirit is in control. And he's influencing you and he, he unctions you and you hear him. And when you hear him, you take heed to what he's saying. Yes? yes? So the Holy Spirit is doing a great work through the people, and Philip is preaching. People are coming to Christ. And so this Simon the Son said, I want some of that. Give me some of that. Then he goes to what extent? He says, I tell you what, I'll buy some of the Holy Spirit from you. Now can the Holy Spirit be bought? Why you say that? Talk to me. Why why you say it can't be bought? The Spirit is something that's given to us. The Spirit is He who, who is given to us. It's a gift. It doesn't cost us anything. So we can't buy it. We can't fool our way into it. Is it a it or a he? So why we can't buy him? 
A lot of business people are being bought off. A lot of judges are being bought off. A lot of lawyers are being bought off. But you cannot buy the Holy Spirit. You have to welcome him in. And when we welcome in God the Father, God the Son, the God the Holy Spirit comes in also. Do we have to get in line for a touch of him? No. Why? People, coliseums are filling up even after COVID, even during COVID. The coliseums are filling up so people can get slain in the Holy Spirit. And now you're telling me that you don't have to get in line for him? Why? Don't you want to go somewhere where, where the man of God can lay his hands on you and the Holy Spirit is ushered in, and when he's ushered in, you do things that you normally wouldn't do. Don't you? Don't that, that make get you excited? Doesn't get you excited? Where the Holy Spirit just comes in and overpowers you, and, and you run into brick walls and don't get hurt, and, and you, you begin to do stuff that, that, that's really, really out of the ordinary for you? No one, no one wants that. No one, no one wants that. Does anybody want? No. Boy, y'all some, y'all some different kind of Christians. Y'all some different, different kind of Christians. Why? Y'all don't want, y'all don't want the Holy Spirit to come in and make you do some things. Ma'am? Not them things. Well, what, what do we what do we want the Holy Spirit? Why do we want the Holy Spirit? Lead us to live right. Yeah. He helps us to live right. Yes. He's a comforter. What does a comforter mean? Brings comfort to you. He brings comfort. He brings soothing. He he brings soothing to you. He. He, he blesses you. He teaches, me. he teaches me. He guides me. He's the Holy Spirit, right? Yes. Was he around before GPS? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You think so? Was he leading us before GPS? Yes. Well, why don't you depend on the Holy Spirit to lead you when you're driving? Why do you call up GPS? Some people cannot live, cannot leave home without the GPS. I see. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit tells you to use GPS? Wow. So the Holy Spirit, He is wise, He is intelligent. He can't be bought. And, and then we have Carol Lee. When, when we get to a point where, where we understand that the Holy Spirit is intelligent and he instructs us and he keeps us, then we just follow his lead. He influences us. Does he influence you? If we listen. Does he lead you? Yeah. Is he disruptive? He disrupts our plans sometimes, huh? Have you ever been saved and know that you're saved and you know you're going to make the right decision and then the Holy Spirit leads you somewhere else? Now, preachers say that I prepared this for today but the Holy Spirit is leading me another way. Is it the Holy Spirit? Can be. Can be. Can be. So, well, if I'm teaching you, I'm speaking to you, and all of a sudden, I just begin to speak in tongues. I'm teaching you, right? I'm teaching you. You're hearing my words. You're instructing. You're being instructed. And all of a sudden, I just start speaking in tongues. Yes? It's not biblical. A lot of people are doing that. 
Why is that not biblical? Okay, I get it. I get Brother Miles to stand up and tell y'all something that the Spirit said to me through him. Is that okay? As long as he's, Brother Miles, you want to try? <laughs> Can we turn the Holy Spirit on and off? No or yes? Can we turn him off? Can we turn him on? Okay, let me ask you. Yes, ma'am. You can quench the spirit. Yeah. You can hold back. I can hold back. I'm I'm driving down the road and I'm going somewhere and I know I shouldn't be going. And then I see the signs at 55 miles an hour, but I just gotta get there. 75. Yeah, 75 won't hurt. It's only a few miles over, right? Is the Holy Spirit leading me or am I leading me? You're leading yourself. You always have a choice. Also, he gives me a choice. He gives me a choice, right? And as he gives me a choice, I decide whether I want to follow the Holy Spirit or I follow him. Or him in me or him outside of me. Because Paul says in Romans 7, we got a wrestle going on. We got a tussle going on. And that tussle is going on all the time, even with saved people. Even with saved people, there's a tussle going on within us all the time. There's a wrestle going on. I mean, y'all wrestling right now as we speak. Come on, raise your hand. Be honest with me. What you wrestling with? <laughs> well, somebody, somebody's wrestling right now with stuff, right? Somebody said, man, I didn't think I would get stuck in Bible study tonight. So you wrestling. You wrestling. That fellow back there wrestling with something. He wrestling with sleep. <laughs> Everybody's wrestling with something, right? We we were at we were at Star of Hope. Preacher got up to preach, and when he got up to preach, let me just share this with you. He gets up to preach, and a brother falls asleep. When he falls asleep, the preacher said, "Hey, wake that brother up back there." The guy next to him said, "You woke him up. You the one to put him to sleep." <laughs> he said, "You the one. That, you the one that put him to sleep. You wake him up." So we, we have to understand, we have to understand that we have the power to obey the Holy Spirit. We have the power to disobey the Holy Spirit. We have the power to ignore the Holy Spirit. And as we have the power to ignore the Holy Spirit, we also have the power to walk with him, to listen to him, to follow. So Simon the Sorcerer being a brand new Christian, he didn't understand that. And he didn't understand it to the point where he wanted to buy him something. Because the Holy Spirit was falling upon people. And I think today, in the 21st century, we find ourselves waiting on the Holy Spirit to fall on us. Is he still falling on people? The Holy Spirit, he, is he falling on people? The Bible says fell on, fell upon the Holy Spirit had not fallen upon any of them. Is he falling upon people? Is he falling upon people now? Are we in a different dispensation? Who said yes? Who said yes and don't want to admit they said yes? Okay, so if we're in the middle of a different dispensation, is there a need for the Holy Spirit to fall upon us? Is there a need for the Holy Spirit to, to hit us? Hmm? He lives in us, right? He dwells in us. He has already come in to reside in us. And as the Holy Spirit resides in us, then we just walk with him. Anybody walking with the Holy Spirit today? Anybody walking with the Holy Spirit in them today? Anybody? Is the Holy Spirit teaching you and preaching to you and, and causing you to pray and causing you to seek God? Because these are the things. Jesus says, when I leave, the Holy Spirit will come. When Jesus leaves in the flesh, the Holy Spirit himself will come and he will agree with what I've already taught you. 
Does God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit ever disagree? Well, why we disagree? If God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is our example, why do we disagree? Number one, with ourselves. What does it mean when you say, one mind told me? <laughs> one mind told me. What does that mean? No one heard. Have y'all not heard that? I have. All my life. So in the other generation, you heard it from the other generation, right? One mind told me. So that means you you have more than one mind. There's a there's a statement in 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 martial arts that says too many minds. What that means is my mind is on several different things at one time. Now let me ask you this question. Have your mind been on several different things at one time? In Bible study, is your mind on several different things at one time? Not now, but sometimes. <laughs> not now, not at this church, but at the church around the corner down the street. <laughs> Lord, that much God spoke. Amen. So the Holy Spirit leads, directs, and protects us. Let's look at verse number 26, and we see if the Holy Spirit leads. When we go to verse 26 all the way to the end of the chapter, we find Philip engaging with a unit. And we want to use our observational skills to identify what Philip goes through and the unit goes through. It says, now, now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise, go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Now that would have kicked some of us out right there. Yep. This is desert. Now the angel of the Lord is instructing Philip to go down near Gaza, which is desert. And we complain about the heat that we feel every day. Is the desert cooler than it is in Houston? No. But check this out. God will always send some word to you to instruct you where to go. God has a way of instructing us where to go, and he has perfect timing. God tells us where to meet folks. God tells us how to present ourselves. God tells us how, when, where to go so he can use us. You know God wants to use you? God wants to use you, and he doesn't just want to use you to benefit you. God wants to use you to benefit other people. So the angel of the Lord comes up to, to Philip and said, look, go and, and go down from Jerusalem to Gaza, and when you get there, you need to understand that the Holy Spirit is going to lead you there, and you need to understand it's desert. So it's hot. Verse 27. So he arose, and he went. My second point to you tonight is when the Holy Spirit leads you, you ought to follow him. When the Holy Spirit leads you, you ought to obey him. The Bible says, Philip arose and he went. Jonah went in a different direction, but Philip goes in the direction that the Holy Spirit was leading. Which one are you? Are you Jonah or are you Philip? The next point you have to see that when God leads you, it's not always pleasant. The Bible says desert. So do you, do you turn away from God simply because it's hard? Do you question whether God is leading you because it's not smooth sailing? Do you question whether God spoke to you because it's hot? Yes, no, maybe so, anybody? So we must understand that it can be hard. It can be hard even when God is leading us. 
It can be hot, even when God's leading us. The last decision you made, that was a lifetime decision. When it gets tough, do you question whether God said it? Yes. Do you? Yes. Why we question whether God said it? It can get challenging. So God leads us even when we run into challenges. Yes. Did God promise us a bed of roses? Did God promise us it's going to always be sweet? No. Every rose come with sticker bushes. Every rose come with thorns. Every rose, every single rose have problems with it. So the man of your dreams going to come with some problems. The one you prayed and bothered God, he gonna have some issues. Even Mr. Tall, Dark, and Handsome. Maybe you should have settled for Mr. Short, Red, and Wrinkled. Everybody have problems. Everybody have issues. And those issues, in the midst of them, we ought not question whether we heard from God. You ought to question whether you hear from God before you move. But once you get in it, you ought to stay in contact with God. Somebody say he's our comforter. He's also our compass. He will lead us in the midst of it. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a unit of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge over all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, we know that this guy is going to get saved, right? Because we know the Bible. We know he's going to get saved. Let me stop and make this point. Just because somebody's coming for worship doesn't mean they're already saved. Just because somebody attends your church service doesn't mean they're already saved. We need to understand just because see people sit in their pews with us doesn't mean they already know Jesus. Don't take for granted because they are on the deacon board or usher board a quiet boy, they are saved. The Bible said he was coming from Jerusalem and he was coming from worship. In the midst of coming from Jerusalem, in the midst of coming from worship, he was unsaved. We know that because he gets saved. And then the next thing you need to understand is that even people of great authority need Jesus. Just because they have power doesn't mean they have Holy Ghost power. Just because they have a labor, a name, just because they have a uniform, just because they have money, just because they have influence doesn't mean that they know God. You ought to rather have somebody that doesn't have a lot of money and know God than to have somebody with a lot of money that doesn't know God. He, he had control of the money. He had control of the queen's money. But he needed Jesus. Isn't that something? Oprah will tell you today that there is more than one, to God, one way to God. Oprah will ask you today, what are those many ways to God? And without a shadow of a doubt, every Christian ought to be able to say, there's but one way. His name is Jesus. The righteous Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world, his name is Jesus. He was returning and he was sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. 
He had an interest in Jesus, didn't he? He had an interest. We can say he had an interest in God's word. He had an interest in Jesus. Isaiah's writing, then the spirit said to Philip, go near and take over the chariot. Go near and take control. When you are a soul winner, it's your responsibility to take control of the conversation. It's your responsibility to win souls as the Holy Spirit opens the door. As the Holy Spirit opens the door, it's your responsibility to step into the door. Your neighbors, your friends, your family members, your associates, it's your responsibility, your co-workers, to walk in the door when the Holy Spirit opens the door. Has the Holy Spirit opened the door for you lately? And the next question is, did you walk in? Did you present Christ? Or did you walk away there, away from there saying, man, I missed it. I remember going to the hospital, seeing a lady, and uh, I was standing there with her mom, and I had come to the conclusion that she was, she was sick, and I was going to come back the next day and lead her to Christ. What do you think happened? She died before I got back the next day. I was most miserable. God opened the door. I was standing at her bedside. She had lived a messed up life. For so all consideration, I didn't know whether she was saved, but I should have walked in the door. She died before I got back the next day. God is opening doors in front of us. All around us. God is opening doors. And as God is opening the door, we have to be willing to walk into the door. So God tells him to, to go near, take over the chariot. So Philip did what? He ran to him. I need to let you know that you ought to get excited and run for Jesus. You ought to get excited and run in answer to the call of God. You ought to get excited and run to the work of God. There used to be a couple here that every time the weatherman said there's a disturbance out in the ocean, they'll call me and say, hey, you know the weather's supposed to be bad tonight. Are we still having Bible study? And my reply was the same every time. What's the difference in us being at home and the weather's bad and being at church and the weather's bad? And then my final reply is, we ought to look for reasons to get together to worship God and not look for reasons to avoid getting together to worship God. We have to look for reasons. We have to make sure that we present ourselves in such a way that God sees us like he saw Philip running. The Bible said he ran to him. He ran to him. He ran to the eunuch. He ran to him. He heard the eunuch reading. He ran to him and he got close enough to him reading. Without a microphone. Without a megaphone. He ran and he got close enough to where he could hear him reading the prophet Isaiah, he said, do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? Look at the reply, verse number 31. He says, how can I unless someone guides me? God set this thing up, didn't he? God knows where the unsaved is and he knows who he wants us to meet the unsaved. And I want to serve you notice he wants you to meet the unsaved. God has set this thing up. He is making appointments for all of us in this room to meet somebody to declare Christ. God has perfect timing. What are the chances? of Philip meeting this man at the time and him reading the verse that he's reading. What, what, is the, what is the opportunity here? God has opened the door and he said to Philip, come and sit with me. 
There was no thought of rejection because the man was asking him to come up and sit with him. Not only does God open the door, not only does God have perfect timing, but God puts us in the perfect situation. I mean, you could not have had a better situation than this situation. The man is so welcoming. He said, come on up here. Come on up here and when you come, sit with me. And then I need to know it, but I need somebody to guide me. He says, how can I know unless somebody guide me? And he answered, Philip said, come up here and sit with me. Verse 32, the place in the scripture which he was reading was that he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. In as a lamb before his shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, he his justice was taken away. And who will declare the generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Who do you think he's talking about? Jesus Christ. He's talking about Jesus Christ. So I tell you all the time, Jesus is just as prevalent in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. The Old Testament points to Jesus. The whole, the whole Old Testament points to Jesus. So whenever we read the Old Testament, whenever we read the New Testament, we ought to look for Jesus. He's there. Even the dash in the Bible. That's your homework assignment. Find the dash. I didn't say the hyphen. Find the dash in the Bible in the Old Testament. Find out where the dash is in the Bible. Moses is talking to God, and there's a dash in the Bible. That dash represents Jesus. Not a hyphen. There's a dash in the Bible. It's just a dash. It's a dash there. And Moses is talking to God. And Moses is sick and tired of these hard-headed folk. And Moses says, why don't you go ahead and bring the dash on the scene? Somebody that can handle these people. Somebody that can forgive them for their sin. I can't handle it. So call me and let me know where the dash is. Don't look for it right now. Just wait. <laughs> It'll be all right. You can get it later. So, so he says that you say he's talking about Jesus because Jesus was led like a sheep to the slaughter. He said not a word. He was humiliated, but he was humble. All the way unto death, they took his life from the earth. That's Jesus. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this is, or whom does he speak of, himself or some other man? Now, God is just laying this thing out. It's so simple. It's so easy for Philip just to follow the pattern of God. The problem is we won't follow God's pattern. God has the plan laid out. Let's just follow God's plan. So who is he talking about? Himself or some other person? Some other man. Then Philip opened his Bible and beginning at the same scripture, preached Jesus to him. Philip opened the Bible. Whether he opened the eunuch's Bible or opened his own Bible, he opened the Bible and he stood where he was standing. He read where he was reading. He started in the same place where he was already reading. The problem is we go to the internet instead of to the Bible. We go to, go to, to commentaries rather than to the Bible. And then he didn't confuse the man by starting somewhere else. Stop trying to tell people your story and just tell them God's story, Jesus' story. Your testimony is good. It gives you goosebumps. It makes people shout. Your testimony is great, but it's not as powerful as Jesus' story. It's not as powerful as Jesus' story. So he picks up right where he was. He started reading right where the unit was reading. Verse 36. 
Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Based on which version you have, verse 37 may be in there, and it may not be in there. Some theologians say verse 37 didn't exist from the original canon. Depends on what your Bible is and what the version of your Bible is, verse 37 is there. Raise your hand if you have verse 37. Verse 37 is there. Raise your hand if you do not have verse 37. Mm, have you ever noticed that? Nope. Really? My Bible study tonight is not in vain. <laughs> if you got an expensive Bible, it has a note in it. If you have a gift Bible, it just skips it. Boy, y'all just got fascinated. I mean, so, so look at verse 37 says, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. In other words, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. Some believe that in the original canon, the original Bible, this verse 37 was not there. And some believe that they left out verse 7, 37 in other versions. But how important is verse 37? Let's see. Somebody read verse 37 for me, please. Stand up right quick and read it real loud. Verse 37 for me. Verse 37. Acts 8, 37. Okay. You can, Philip answer, if you believe with all your heart. And the eunuch replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Wow. Is that an important verse? Is that a verse that we need to hear? Yes. Now many theologians believe that it wasn't in existence. But if you just follow the flow of things, you understand that Philip refused to baptize him until he became saved. So when we baptize, we only baptize because someone has confessed Christ Jesus as their Lord. We don't baptize so children can eat communion. We don't baptize because their friends are getting communion. We only baptize when somebody gets to know Jesus as their Savior. When somebody comes to Christ, that is the only reason we baptize. So Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's why we ask children. We don't lead them. We, we don't prompt them. We don't key them in. But we ask them, what do you believe about Jesus? And it's up to that child or those children to tell us, we believe that he is the Son of God, that he died for my sins and rose from the dead. Then we baptize him. If they confess Christ as their Savior. Because baptism is an outward show of an inward belief, right? Yes. So when, the, when you're standing in the water, you're saying, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And when the preacher, deacon, or person lay you down in the water, you're saying, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. And he was buried in a borrowed tomb. In this case, a watery grave. And when they bring you back up out of the water, you said, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And the reason why I'm being baptized is I believe this story. And I trust no story other than this story to get me to heaven when I die. This story and this story alone, it is so easy to be saved. It is so easy to be born again. But we have made it so hard. We want to do 10 Hail Marys. We want to turn around 12 times. We want to speak in tongues. We want to run the floor. All these things you may do that's left up to you. But what you must do is repentantly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He died for your sins and rose from the dead. Then you qualify to be baptized. So somewhere we need to make sure we stop baptizing children just because they won't communion. 
Because in some churches, they, they serve uh, uh, wine for communion. And so you're teaching your child at an urban age that he didn't even know Jesus how to drink. And some people let them take communion so they won't hear them throw temper tantrums. But they need to be saved. They need to be born again. They need to know Jesus in the departing of their sin. Philip says, if you believe into all your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you should be baptized. Verse 38. So the moment he said, I believe this, you notice they didn't stop and pray. <laughs> you notice, you notice they didn't stop and do the sinner's prayer. Have you ever noticed that Philip in this unit did not stop to do the sinner's prayer? Was he really saved? When we look at Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says that if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth, he believed in his heart, he said it out loud with his mouth, and then the next verse, verse 38 says, so he commanded the chariot to stand still. Remember, the Holy Spirit told Philip to go take over. And Philip took over. And when he took over, he commanded somebody else's chariot to stop. Now you want to talk about power. When God unctions you and you follow him, he will give you power to take over. It says to us tonight that we are the soul winners that ought to be in control of the soul winning experience. You in control. You, you call to be in control. The reason why some people don't realize they're in control is because they scared of rejection. They scared they're going to say something wrong. And if, if you're afraid of rejection, then what that tells me that you are more concerned about you and how you look and how you feel than you are about winning a soul. God wants us to be more concerned about winning a soul than we are concerned about how we feel in the experience or how we handle things in the experience or how people leave us in the experience, whether we live good or bad in the experience. We ought to be fools for Jesus. Because we're going to be a fool for somebody. Yes? You can, you're going to be, Paul says, I am a servant. I am a slave for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not a slave for the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a slave for the devil. Because you're going to be a slave for somebody. You're going to be a servant for somebody. Or something. Do so you worship your car? You worship your house? You worship your woman, your man? You worship your instrument? You worship your career? You worship your child, no. your parents. No. You gonna worship something and somebody. The question is, who is your God and who are you gonna lend your allegiance to? Early in school, when I was growing up, there were two things we did first thing in the morning. What was that? At school. First two things we did first thing in the morning. At school. Pray the allegiance and prayer. We may still be doing the pledge of allegiance. But we're not playing corporate, praying corporate prayers anymore. But I, even as a little boy, I wonder, why are we pledging allegiance to the flag, to the United States of America? When I pledge my allegiance to something, that means I'm going to follow that at all costs. No, I'm not, an, not anti-U.S. or anything. I am pro-God. And when you pledge your allegiance to some, you ought to pledge your allegiance to the one who woke you up this morning. The one who keeps your mind. Even in a desert, even in a hostile environment. How many of you thought this week alone, and the week is just halfway gone, how many of you thought this week alone, I really could have told her a piece of my mind. I really could have gave her or uh, him what I really felt. Not yet, wait till tomorrow. 
But God, God, because you worship him, you pledge your allegiance to him, you don't want to make him look bad. You don't want the critics to say, oh, I thought you were a Christian. You knew you should have done that and you did it anyhow. We need to understand we have to pledge our allegiance to God and our allegiance to the flag in the United States of America will fall in place. Some people pledge their allegiance to the almighty dollar. They're more concerned about the money than they are about their God. Philip commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the unit went down into the water, and he baptized him. How many people went into the water? Two people went into the water. It says to us that baptism is through immersion or submersion. Meaning you got to go under the water. It didn't say that Philip sprinkled him. It says that they went, and in my Bible said both of them, both of them, both of them went in the water. And Philip baptized him. Baptized, this word baptized comes from the Greek word baptizo which means to put something all the way under the water. It comes from the word that we get the fabric, where we baptize the fabric. When you put, when you put cotton in water that's tainted, it comes back up a different color. So the way we got different colors on our clothes is because our clothes been baptized in colors. You've done tie-dye before, right? When you tie dye a shirt, you turn it into every which way, and you sprinkle different colors on it, and when you open it back up, it's been baptized. And it has evidence of baptism because it's different colors. This word baptism means baptizo. It means to be put all the way under the water. The Bible says they, they went both unto the water and they were he was baptized. Verse 39 says, now when they came to came up out of the water, came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. Let me just tell you, it's not important that people give you props. The Bible says he's led by the Spirit and the Spirit of God catches him up. The Spirit of God didn't even hit him. He get caught up in the Spirit and the Spirit of God catches him up, and the eunuch saw him no more. Didn't even give him a business card. Didn't give him his Instagram. Didn't give him his Twitter. The Bible says he was no more. And then as you conclude in verse number 40, well, look at verse number 39 first. So that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. I want to tell you, it's a mighty good time to rejoice in the Lord when somebody comes to Christ and somebody gets saved. Even the saved one ought to rejoice. And even the one who's a witness ought to rejoice. It's a good time. It's a mighty good time. When somebody gets to know Jesus, even with the evidence of baptism, it's a mighty good time. It's a good time. We all celebrate. The Bible says in Luke chapter 15 that when the boy came back home, they threw a party and they celebrated. The Bible says when the woman found her coin, she, probably, she called the other housewives over and they really celebrated. The Bible says when the, when the shepherd found his sheep, he put him on his shoulder, he brought him back to the house, he called the other shepherds and said, man, y'all come over, let's, shepherd, let's celebrate. We are to celebrate when one soul comes to Christ. Verse 40 says that Philip was no more and he found himself over in a whole different land and as he was passing through the cities, he continued to preach. And what did he preach? 
You preach Jesus. Jesus, him crucified and resurrected. The door of the church is open. Invitations extended. We all need Jesus. If you never received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment, this is your opportunity to get it right with God. If you would receive him tonight, if you just believe this simple story, that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And he rose from the dead. You can be saved right here, right now. Would you just bow your head with me and invite Christ into your life? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and thank God. We believe that if you honestly prayed this prayer, believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're now saved, you're born again, you're on your way to heaven, and we believe that God has made you a new. Thank you for joining us on our broadcast. Thank you for being a part of our service. Please feel free to tune in every Wednesday at 7.15 p.m. every Wednesday night. Tune in on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our Sunday school. And also stay tuned for 10.30 a.m. for our worship service. It is now often time. It's time for us to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give electronically, do so by Zell. Our Zell account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zell account. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do so by mailing it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for blessing us with money, with increase. We thank you for blessing us, Father God, again for the opportunity to give. We ask you to bless every giver and bless us as we come to give even right now. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
talk to him about God and okay. I, I want to we're praying for salvation for Mr. Gosta. Amen. 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 Gosta. Gosta. Come here. Spell that for me, please. G-E-E-R-N-A-N. Are you pronounce it again? G-E-E-R-N-A-N. German. German. Jemina. Jemina. Gaza. Amen. Look at that. I'm speaking Spanish. Lord. Look at that. I'm, I'm growing in the Lord. I, I'm speaking Spanish. We want to pray for him. And we want to pray for those who are mentioned. Let's go to God. Father God, we thank you for these gifts. We ask you to bless every given. We ask you, Father God, to return to them even 100 fold. Now, Lord, we pray for those names mentioned in this place. We pray for those on our prayer list. We pray, Father God, for blessing us and we pray, Father God, that you continue to give them what they need. Lord, we're looking forward to great testimonies. We pray for the young lady that's missing. We ask you to bless her to be found safely. We pray that you bless her, Father God, to be found unharmed and untouched. We pray, Father God, for the salvation of Mr. Garza. We ask you to bless him, bother him by way of the Holy Spirit. Introduce him to Jesus the Christ that his life will be changed, that he will be made the different. We pray for Sister Taylor. We ask you, Father God, to, to touch her body even right now, Lord. We ask you to amaze the doctors and bless the doctors to see Jesus in her. And bless, Father God, that she will rise up again, that she will give you the praise and the glory. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only God, Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join by saying, Amen. We are united in the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are lifting, as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed. Thank you.